Hello. How are hey, you Doc, all? How are you? Thanks I vouch, for listening I, for a bit. I vouch for Dr. Goodman as well. Thank you, I really Gabby. appreciate your work a lot. Thank you. Abby. And it's harder than it looks in some ways. It What's is. that expression? It's not as easy as it looks. Right? And, our, and our slogan is, I don't care what it looks like, it just feels good because <laughs> you're going to look like a little bit of an idiot when you learn foundation training, but you're going to feel wonderful. But that's not what this is about. This isn't about foundation training. This is about you two. And I want to take that very seriously. You're extraordinary humans. You've done a lot of really wonderful things. I'm going to start with Gabby because, A, I've known Gabby for a while, and I've seen, I've seen you and Laird innovate. I've watched it. I've gone through it. I've checked my ego in ridiculous ways being at your house and going through XPT-type stuff. I have too, by the way. Yeah. Where, <laughs> So my first question for you two, mm -hmm. and, and you're, I want you to ask the, answer this afterwards, but it's a little different. <clears throat> You've been an athlete for a long time. Laird's been an athlete for a long time. Why are you still trying to be athletes? What does that do for your life at this stage? That's a good question. I think it might be very similar to a lot of people in this room. I think, um, you know, Laird and I probably have different reasons and similar reasons. So. Um, you know, for me personally, what happened is I got introduced to um, fitness or the notion of training for improvement through the idea of trying to be better in my sport. And then what you start to realize is I sleep better. I think I function as a better person overall, even my reactions to things. Ed I concur, see? I like that. I know whose baby Absolutely that is, Jesse. Right. <laughs> Say it. You don't have to take him out of here. It's okay. Um, and so I, what it is, is I think sometimes, and I was just talking to a friend of mine in the back, Logan, who's also an exceptional uh, performance trainer, and it's this idea of, it's not like, oh, I'm ripped, I shred, what'd you bench, what'd you overhead snap? I mean, there's an element to that if it improves your performance, but can I be more clear as a person? Can I be more compassionate? Can I continue to grow and change? So I think that is definitely part of it for me now that I'm not competing any longer. And listen, I think as a woman, the idea of being able to express yourself in that way, in that play way, in that get it done way, I think there's something really good that keeps you balancing out a little more, especially like you add kids and all of a sudden you're talking about dinner and who's going where and you want to just be like, I just want to get after it. And that's a very straightforward thing that also keeps me balanced as a person. Now in Laird's uh, case, that's a little different. Um, that's about a, a really singular, intense love and passion for something that he is making sure he's doing everything that he can in order to do that. And I think for me, I, I think maybe because he did it in this way that it was sort of like, I'll show up if the conditions are right and I'll ride what I think is the right thing to ride, he's not burnt out. You know, a lot of athletes, um, let's say, especially in ball and stick sports, they tell you when to show up, when to compete, how to do it. I think that's what you get tired of, not the thing that you love. And so he has been fortunate in that um, he didn't get burnt out. Now, how he has the energy, I'm not really sure, uh, because it's, it's pretty non-wavering. And, um, and, it's, and it's also, there's a creative element. So I think that's the other side, right? If you did the same training all the time, it would be really boring, but if you were open to starting again or not being good at something like we do in our lives, try a new sport, go do something new, it keeps it interesting. I tried a 240 degree sauna at your house the other day. I'm that's, still sweating, it <laughs> hasn't stopped. But I think that's better than the 32 degree ice tub, but that's something, yeah. I've worked with a lot of athletes of a lot of different types and, and I will say, that Laird moves differently than every athlete I've ever worked with, very differently, from different parts of his body, like a gorilla, like a primate. It's powerful, it's unreal. And, and to watch him innovate, instead of going for strength and prowess, he goes for endurance and durability. And it's a very different style of training for an athlete. And I recommend anybody into their 30s start looking at durability as opposed to strength and force production or even force absorption. Durability is what's gonna get you to where she is and where she wants to go and where I wanna to go too. So pay attention to that stuff. And but I've also learned the hard way. I have a fake knee and um, that was repetitive trauma. If any of you are doing sports, and I'm, I'm gonna, I want Paige to pick up, but if you're doing something with repetitive motion, how do we 
unwind what we're winding all the time. So I think that's another important part of if you're sitting all day long in your desk, what can you do? Um, and Dr. Goodman certainly has that discussion with a lot of people. So I think the unwinding of what we're winding up, especially if we have a, a sport, um, should really be integrated into your training. And when I was in my days, we weren't really unwinding. Mm -hmm. You're still in your days. <laughs> Thank you, Paige. <laughs> that was good. You're right. So, Paige. Uh, so, same same question first. Like, you know, why why do you want to be an athlete? Uh, everybody's got a different reason, but more more significant than that is, where do you hope it takes you in life? Where do you hope that health leads the way to? Um, well, just to touch on kind of a lot of what Gabby said, I think when I was growing up as a little kid, I was an athlete. Um, from day one. My mom had me, you know, swimming in the water before I could walk, and I was jumping on a trampoline nonstop as a kid. I was playing baseball, soccer, uh, track and field, doing a little bit of everything. And so surfing kind of took over my life and became my true passion, and that's something that I've pursued as a career. Um, but being an athlete was kind of something that was, I guess, just born into me, and it's something that, like Gabby said, I feel being a woman in sport and being able to do and have this, these experiences in the water for me translates into being a better human and a better um, person in my community and a better role model and friend. And I really truly believe that. And I think coming from an athletic background, it's hard to imagine not having that. You know, That was my source and my way of expressing myself. And it still is, and it's something that I feel like I'm still getting better and better and better. And I just turned 30, and everyone said that things change when you turn 30, and I truly feel that, but I also feel like I'm in the best shape and the happiest that I've ever been in my life. And I'm really looking forward to the next progression and continuing to get better and better, and it's something that drives me is to continue to push the level for myself, not just in sport, but how I feel. And it makes me feel good, so that's why I pursue it. <laughs> that's perfect. And feeling good is enough of a goal, by the way. You know, a lot of the world needs relief and is looking for it very heavily, so try to help them find it if you can. I think Paige said something that's really important for everyone, is that, um, and if I haven't, I would have been under these, this thinking more. I think living with Laird has helped this. I think we limit ourselves by the sh construct that we live in. Oh, you're 20, oh, you're 30, oh, you're 40, oh, you're 50. And I think, to your point, Dr. Goodman, if we can actually keep ourselves feeling good, then uh, there's no reason that in 10 years you're not sitting here talking about you know, riding large waves because now you have 10 more years of experience, which your sport especially, that's a, such a valuable asset, like all sports, but really in, in that genre of sport. And so I think that's another thing that's really changed in training, which is it's not, it, you know, it's, it's redefining it for yourself and not, you know, creating a limitation, oh, I'm because I'm 35 or oh, because I'm 40, especially in sport, which, you know, if ever, any of you watch a Federer match, you'd think the guy was 100, the way they talk about it. But he's only top, I don't know, five in the world, poor thing. You know, it's like at a certain point, that becomes the story versus how do you feel and how are you performing? I think that's the curse of being a champion, in truth. I think that as you age and develop the other elements of your life that come with age, because to become a, a champion, you have to be reasonably singularly focused. But what comes at 30 and 40, I think, at least from the people I've worked with and spoken to is, yes, there are physiological changes in your body, but those changes lend themselves to more endurance, more awareness, more understanding of the self, more patience for the self, more understanding of others. And I'll trade that any day for youth any day, because in youth you got this power, but you don't know where to direct it always. And I think that to, to be where the two of them are, you, that you figured out how to direct it at a young age. So into older age, you get to enjoy the benefits of that. As long as you keep changing it up. I think the only you know, dangerous part of when you get older and you get good at enough few things is those are the things that you'll keep doing. And I think as long as something you see, and I don't mean jumping on every trend or fad, but if something you see something and you think something about that resonates with me and, and I think I'm gonna try it, and maybe you're not even particularly good at it in the beginning, that is where the growth happens. So I think as long as when we get 
you know, we continue to age and, and, and things make sense to who we are and the way we move. I mean, Paige and I are both very tall. We have long levers. You know, overhead snapping may not be our best friend mm -hmm. in the whole world, um, but finding things that work uh, for the individual. So I'd say with age, that's the only thing that focus is, it does become brilliant, but then keep adding to the story. Go ahead. And just, I think age is, it truly is just a number. It's a, your process of learning. And for me, it's just speaking about doing things different and keeping things fresh, um, as Laird and yourself do. Um, that's something for me recently that I've really kind of grasped, you know? It's not just about the groveling and the surf, 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 surf. And for me, I love being in the ocean, so, playing in all sorts of different watercrafts, whether it be in body surfing or foiling or riding waves. And um, for me, it's just keeping it fresh and fun and being excited about something. And that keeps me feeling like a little kid, you know, keeping it fresh and also for your body and like speaking about unwinding. And um, if you're doing the same repetitive thing all the time, you're maybe not as creative in your mind and your body definitely takes a toll. So keeping it fresh is important in everything in life. If you could say, I, they gave me some questions, but you know. If you could say the two or three things in your life that didn't, don't, don't, let's not say they affected your health. Let's not say they affected this, this piecemeal part of you. What brought you into that, that flow ability that I know a lot of the greatest athletes and the greatest thinkers and the greatest doers and musicians can access? Sometimes it will, but not always. But, we find as you grow, you, you find the things that get you into that ease and efficiency of athleticism or thinking or performing, whether it's nutritionally or thought, you know, maybe it's mantras, maybe it's an exercise, maybe it's whatever. Let's, Gabby, if you don't mind, if you, don't, if you can think of a couple, and then Paige, if you can think of a couple. I think for me, you know, be, being from a team sport, uh, a little more, I think, you know, as far as personal flow, and, and this may be a strange answer, but fear initially was a, a great motivator for me, right? Like getting uber focused before I'm going to compete and having that, that sort of edge and then realizing that uh, I was just going to do the best I could. Mm -hmm. And so really, what did that mean? Did I prepare? So ultimately, it was me working enough in my preparation to allow myself to go into the flow. And now that I'm, you know, I'm almost 49 years old, hopefully at some point you get a little flow here and there. Um, I, I'll tell you, I do this underwater pool training a lot. And what is so amazing, and for my surfers here, you know this uh, intuitively because you are in mother nature and her power is always greater than any of our power is, I've been in so many drills now that if I want to complete the task, I actually have to relax. And it's the only way. And I've tried it, believe me, all the other ways. I've tried it faster, I've tried it harder, I've tried to will it. And the water has certainly been the greatest teacher of, you, you will move how I tell you to move. And um, you know your brain takes 50% of your oxygen. So you can imagine uh, task completion is not everything is about getting after it. At times, it's about surrendering and, and using other tools that we have. So, for example, I have a friend, Kenny Kane, maybe some of you know him, he's a really talented trainer, and he talks about, you know, is hard, like, the only gear? It certainly isn't. And, and so, for me, when you talk about flow, it's, can we hold the paradoxical space? What does it take me right now? I'm gonna be a killer, and right now over here, I'm gonna yield. I'm gonna fold and, and be mellow. But it takes preparation, and it takes putting yourself in really uncomfortable situations enough to say, I prefer the flow, so I'm gonna go with it, and I'm struggling today, and I'm, I'm gonna handle that too. Um, and then I, there's something that you guys are gonna hear in every group, I'm, I'm sure. And believe it or not, I think it's the community that I have created. I think that, um, the something that has helped me more than anything in my life is having, is having that really magical community and those people that allow you to be who you are but then tell you to you know, get your ass moving and you can do it and let's go. And that sort of love and um, elevation I think has helped me create the greatest amount of flow. 
Go ahead, Paige. Can't really follow that. Yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, no, you can, because what you do is so dangerous. So it's a very different answer. Yeah. I think for myself, tapping into that flow and I think it's different for every single person on what that actually means. But for myself, I definitely, as you were saying, tapping into that and being in the ocean is what is, makes it easy for me. You know, we have these giant swells that pop up two weeks out and everyone starts talking about them. And I live on Maui, so a week out, everywhere you go, every store, every coffee you go and buy, someone's talking about the swell coming. My phone's blowing up. and. It's hard to kind of stay settled in all of that, and I find myself actually getting really stressed out and ignoring phone calls. And um, three days out, you know what the swell is going to be like, and the day before, you're preparing all your boards and getting the ski ready and gassing up, and and then all that's really left to do is go out and do it. And I, when I show up at the lineup at Jaws, I'm so excited. And as soon as I actually get off of the jet ski or off of the rocks, however we're going out, as soon as I'm in the water, that's when I tap into my flow. And that's, I think, what my essence of being in the ocean, that is something that it, that's who, or the feeling that I'm searching for, it's just about getting in the ocean and whether you catch a wave or not. Um, but utilizing mother nature and being able to embrace that and that's my flow for sure. And breathing. Breathing is key. <laughs> breathing is key. What if you come from like an airplane ride? Because a lot of you guys, I know Greg Long's back there and, I, you know, surfers, like I'm always in awe that a surfer can travel halfway around the world and then be like, all right, got to get off and got to go. How do you connect with that? I'm just curious. I struggle um, with that a do? lot. Yeah. Um, especially, com like, say, coming to Mavericks, you're jumping on a red eye flight after being out at Jaws all day dehydrated and tired <laughs> and you have to get on a flight and get over here and go straight out into the lineup it's definitely a challenge those last minute swells and the last minute flights are definitely the hardest um, but I think it's also just your mindset and if that's what you're after and what you want to chase it's you're gonna do anything in your power to get there and to do it so it's all about your mind and touching on breathing <laughs> and just remembering why you're doing it On. Can you You're hear the me? boss. There we go. Hey. All right. So we're going to open up actually one more time for some questions from the crowd. And feel free to ask Eric some questions, too, because this guy knows his stuff. Uh, anybody out here curious? No? Shelby. Of course Shelby is. Well, thank you. I loved your answer on how you tap into flow. I'm really curious, like, any hacks or things you do daily, like, Gabby, I've seen you do sauna and ice bath and s certain forms of Wim Hof style breathing. Mm -hmm. Can you guys both talk about what you do? And Paige, what do you do? Do you have a breathing technique that you use? Or I've seen you stand on balls. Like, can you just give us a few of your, of your tricks and tips on how you guys stay so fit and uninjured? Uninjured is key. <laughs> I was just talking to Greg about that. Um, I think it's different for everyone and everyone's body is different. And for me, I've found uh, basically through years of injury and just trying to be the most fit and feel, just feeling good, I've found kind of a program that works for me and it might not be what everyone, you know, what would work for everyone. Um, and I think it's a little bit of everything, and it's keeping it fresh. We're not doing the same workouts every single day. It's a progression, and being in the ocean and doing rock running, and all you know, you see the photos of us running with rocks. We actually do it. <laughs> and um, I think it's just all about tapping into something that works specifically for you. And I do a lot of stuff at a, a local gym two minutes away from my house. I'm there five days a week if I'm at home. Um, but it's all different things, you know? It's not always hard, and it's, always, it's not always lifting weights. Like, half, I'd say 99% of things we do, we don't use any weight at all, just body mo movement, which you should touch on. Um, but I think it's just, yeah, it's keeping it fresh and keeping it different and finding what makes you feel good. I think recovery is highly underrated, and I think the more we can move on one foot through full ranges of motion, is really important. And then the number one thing, 
uh, that we all are born with, it's free and you can do it anywhere, is the breathing. So the only one scientific fact I'll share with you today is pretty much if we, unless you're, gonna, you're scrubbing your CO2 to go for a, a deep dive, uh, or you're doing a sprint on a track and you're trying to recover through your mouth, uh, we should all be nose breathing. Uh, your CO2 rises in your system when you breathe through your nose, and the only way for the oxygen to go from your bloodstream to your cells and tissue, tissue meaning muscle tissue, is to have your CO2 present. If you scrub your CO2, it's not able to go from the bloodstream into the tissue. So just on science, if everyone could breathe with their, um, their nose, I think that's a really simple tool, and again, it's, it's free. And <laughs> you can do it at your desk. Seven second inhales to seven second exhales uh, throws you in your parasympathetic after about two minutes, so you're calm body. That's an easy one. Eric, what about you? Any, any free <laughs> tips? Yes, a lot. <laughs> First and foremost is your head leads the way. Don't smell your way through life. Don't pinch the back of your neck and everything you do while you're looking at your phone like this and all of a sudden to find her eyes in line, you're looking up like this. Look around, everybody does it. There's a very big difference in the human frame from here to here. Okay, and it's not don't sit, it's not sitting kills, that's nonsense, it's absolute nonsense. It's how you do things not, that matters, not what you do in life. So my tip is, whatever you're doing, be it sitting, standing, lying down, kneeling, lunging, running, swimming, do it with the head on axis, which means the chin is pulled back as if there's a dagger point. In fact, everybody right now, put your little index finger right under your chin, and I want you to feel the pressure of your chin. I want you to lift it up, and then I want you to pull your chin back away. And if you start talking like this, you're doing a really nice job. But you see these muscles? These are important muscles, very important muscles on the human frame. And if they get weakened or out of position, they, they create sort of a discrepancy and dismay every single segment of the spine down. So I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to feel that. I want you to feel well. Um, learn foundation training if you can, but I'm not here to sell that. If you can do it, great. It's free sometimes or you can pay sometimes, however you get it. Um, it's fine. Just get it. But what I am here to do is, is help you understand that there's a lot you can do for yourselves at any age. I work with people from... 10 to you know, 80, and, and I work with people that have use of their limbs, and I work with people that do not have use of their limbs. And, and I'll tell you one thing I know for sure. Every single human being in this room and every single human being you interact with can find a little bit more comfort, a little bit more strength, a little bit more relief with absolutely no other tools by becoming aware of how their body feels, how it holds themselves. Creating surface area utilization everywhere you can find it in your body. Make your body bigger at being itself. Take up more space, take up more real estate. I promise you start to feel better. Thanks, Doc. All right, I think we got a couple more right in here. We'll wrap it up here in a minute. Um, Gabby, you started to touch on this, and I'm curious if others have uh, advice on this. So I'm sure for me and a lot, most of us probably in this room, hi there. I'm sure for a lot of us in this room, we like to get after it you know, every day. It feels good, uh, it's fun. Um, our minds and bodies need it, uh, but you started talking about recovery. Do you have advice on on days to off days, how to recover? Um, any advice on rest and recovery and how to work that into the, into the agenda? First of all, the idea, I am a big advocate of scheduled workouts, but the idea of a scheduled day off is ridiculous because what if your scheduled day off is Friday but you feel terrible on Wednesday, genuinely terrible? So the whole thing is being in touch first with your body. Hydration is wildly overlooked as well. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna throw an idea out to you, um, especially type A people, I understand. Um, we use training and getting after it to avoid a lot of other things in our life. And so sometimes it's also to under, understand, am I trying to get after it because I'm trying to be busy and be like getting after it out here versus going in here and sitting with it? And so I think it's, it's calibrating and using it as a tool. Yeah, I'm rested, I'm, I've cleared the decks, I'm pretty peaceful in my life, and I can get after it. Um, I think mobility, full range of motion, all exercises, if we can do them through full ranges of motion, then we're doing it right. Hard for boys, you go into gym, everyone's got macho weight, check it out. It's like, yeah, but you only do it one third of the way through the motion. So I think it's just rejiggering those definitions. But listen, if five days in a row you've been sleeping and you feel great and you're hydrated and things are happening and you want to go, I, I think as long as you're going in different ways, why not? 
see? And they still move the best, by the way, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but remember, yeah, I'm just going to no, touch please. on the baby thing for a yeah. second. I've been watching, we, my wife and I have a nine-month-old in the back of the room there. Hi, Sunny. And uh, we've been watching her movement as she's starting to move more. And I've always told people that babies move well, and I've always looked and watched. And I, only, and, and I don't want to say move like a baby, because you shouldn't. None of you should. You're all well-formed adults to some degree. And I want you to remember that. You're well-formed adults. That means you have gone through plasticity processes. You've gone through experiences that have lended themselves to scar tissue and rigidity and flexibility. And to reiterate what Gabby is saying, to go through full ranges of motion in exercise is the key to exercise. And full ranges of motion means you can get yourself there and under your own power without any tools or anything like that, you can get yourself back. Full range of motion is very active, very active. It's not being stretched. It's not being other than yourself. Nobody's there helping you unless they're guiding you. But you gotta be active. You gotta be powerful at the end ranges of motion as well as the beginning and middle and elsewhere. Paige, you wanna chime in? Again, hard to follow. <laughs> I'd say recovery definitely is a key component in our training that we do um, at our facility, our gym that we train at performance training center um, it is something that is somewhat scheduled but it's also based off of a schedule of what we're working towards in a week or in a month or in 12 weeks so utilizing that recovery is very key and getting enough sleep that's something that you know we don't drink enough water we don't breathe enough and we don't get enough sleep and for me that's something that I'm running a little bit low on at the moment but it's very important for the way that my body functions and how I can perform at my highest level. And if I'm not sleeping well, that definitely translates into my training and my conversations and who I am. So make sure you're getting enough sleep. Absolutely. One, one quick touch on that. And this is, this is the only reason I'm here, um, is that scientists and doctors and trainers, we follow what athletes do. We're a step or two behind of the innovative edge of health. We figure it out along the way, and we might be able to break it down differently for people or understand ways to perhaps improve upon it. But the human body will only improve if it's tested. And scientists and doctors can't test a body like an athlete can. It takes courage. It takes the ability to really manage fear. And one of the really interesting things is action sports athletes are at the forefront of health. If you want to see the best information about healthcare, go look at aging BMXers, aging motocross racers, aging snowboarders. The football players, the hockey players, they all get the same injuries, man. They get the same type of stuff. They got the same types of protocols. They got the same issues. They're not falling from 40 feet going 70 miles an hour with a human frame, going to somebody saying, F fix me. I'm really, really broken. And the guys and girls at the front line of fixing those people have to get very creative of how to put bodies back together. And guess what? You don't put them back together. You teach them how to put themselves back together. Because ultimately, as an athlete or as a person, your structural integrity, your capacity to pull your own web together and apart is going to dictate probably more than 70 or 80 percent of your health, pain, and anxiety throughout your life. You gotta learn to be aware and control and sense what's happening within you and look to the best athletes to learn how. I think Danny Way is a very good example, actually. I've seen that guy put himself back a few times and uh, Paul Check helped him with that. And uh, I think to your point, it is a creative process and if it's not working, keeping the faith that something will work and also being compliant. None of us like to do or exercises or rehabilitation, but if you're a compliant patient, I think you're probably rewarded. Yeah, for sure. Who here thought they were gonna come and hear the words, put your bodies back together? <laughs> um, everybody, one more thank you for these three up on stage.